is kind of like the ultimate it girl. Out of all of the pomp and propriety that came from the French court at the time, also came Marie Antoinette and uh, my obsession with her and her clothes. She's kind of like a rebel without a cause and you know, so am I. We're both, we're both rebels. I once got a prize in primary school for being the best rule follower. So two years ago I went to visit the Palace of Versailles and from that point I was kind of obsessed with her and then when I saw Sofia Coppola's film aptly named Marie Antoinette I was definitely obsessed particularly with costumes that were done like they are chef's kiss. The corset or stays as they're often called in the film that I'm trying to recreate with my own corset is from the milkmaid scene which is where Marie Antoinette performs to the court and everyone's a bit like mm, what's she doing but her husband loves it. This is kind of a romantic ideal of what she would have imagined a milkmaid to wear. But it's also one of the few chances in the film that we get to see the undergarments that they wear which is crucial to creating that 18th century shape. So the costume designer for Marie Antoinette is obviously Milena Cannonero, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, who also did the costumes for films like Out of Africa, The Clockwork Orange, and also most of Wes Anderson's films. I see a trend developing here. Milena Cannonero actually happens to be my mum's brother, sister's dog, skinny pig, um, sister's dog, hair, skinny pig, skinny pigs, twice um, mother's, mother's pops, new cousin, and sister. So I think we're on quite good enough terms for me to call her and have a little quick chat and some advice about the costumes. Hi Milena, I hope you're well. Ooh, hurry up. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had any advice. I'm not really interested in costume per se or in frocks. Are, are you at an award show ceremony? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I've almost passed my driving test, so basically equal. <laughs> Unlike other videos I've done, I actually sketched this corset out, so let's get going. If you know anything about historical clothing, then you need not be reminded that corsets were not worn alone, but were always worn over a chemise of sorts. In the film, Marie wears a white linen chemise with three quarter length sleeves, so this is what I'm painting here. And as for the corset itself, I already knew that I was going to use the 1760s corset pattern as provided in Mandy Barrington's Stays and Corsets Volume 2. In the film, the stays are like a red wedgewood pattern, but I prefer blue, so I chose blue wedgewood printed curtaining for that outer layer of the corset, and then cheaply sourced but super thick calico for the lining layer. Then I was on to drafting out the corset pattern, using my basic block as the guide. Because corsets and stays are supposed to fit you like a glove, or a corset for that matter, it's a good idea to work from the block so that the final product is the correct size. Before making up the real thing, I firstly made up a mock-up out of this remnant. This was actually a screen printed fabric I made and it was supposed to be a cute little scene of a father and daughter doing some ballet dancing, but it kind of more resembles a scene from Matilda. I won't go into too much detail on the mock-up, but it definitely helped me with working out the construction as I was doing a mixture of internal and external burning channels and I needed to work out how I was going to um, <clears throat> uh, insert the bones. And then it was on to the real deal. So first I cut out the lining or inner fabric, making sure to leave my obligatory 2.5 seam allowance. And then I marveled at the beauty of the outer fabric. How pretty! After that, I laid out the pattern for the outer layer, drew on where the boning channel should be positioned and cut it out. Once they're snipped into shape, I find it useful to lay the pieces out into their pairs to visualise the construction as spatial awareness is definitely not one of my strong points. Then I began basting in the seam allowances and boning channel lines by hand, which I then realised could be done way quicker by machine. Because the bones I was using were 9mm wide, I made the boning channels 1cm wide. Then I pinned and sewed the inner and outer layers right sides together and ironed them out. After that it was time to do the boning channels and as usual I used my pressing bars to get the correct sizing. Once you've sewn down the length you can iron the channels and trim off the excess seam allowance. Then exactly like I did in my 1890s corset video, you need to measure the width of your boning channels, divide this number by two and then mark this on each of the seams in between your corset pieces so that you know where to sew the channels down. These are known as external burning channels as the boning is positioned on the outer part of the garment. So I sewed these on first as when I sandwiched the internal boning channels between my two fabric layers later on, I would find it impossible to get those bones in. 
There is probably a way of doing this, but I haven't discovered it yet. So forgive me. I mean, we're nearly at Christmas after all. <laughs> and there they are, all sewn on. Nice. Fun fact, I've actually met Michael Rosen. I've now pinned the entirety of the front corset to the lining as neat as I possibly can and hopefully there's not going to be any bubbles because now we're going to do the very exciting thing of doing the boning channels, like sewing them down. We're going to see how that goes. Yee, so these are the internal channels which you will then sandwich the bones in between. Just follow the basting lines that you already made to get a super straight line down. And that is what the inside layer looks like. Lovely. So I'm interested, you know, what do you guys do when you're sewing? Do you like listen to YouTube videos? Do you listen to music? What's going on when you sew? I've been listening to classical music and it's making me feel like I am the heroine of like Amadeus. What is that? Do you ever just drop all of the pins and they go everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> Next you can measure out where you need the bones to be cut. I use mainly spiral steel boning but for the centre back bones I use straight steel as this is where the eyelets will be so there's going to be a lot of strain on that area. I found that it was easiest to just hold up the wires to the fabric to eyeball the length and then tape around the bit that needs chopping with some masking tape. To keep track of which channels I had already measured I drew on a cross with my heat removable pen. Cool, what a brain I have, like the ideas are just revolutionary honestly then request assistance to cut the bones themselves you want a photograph of that class going in i've done it it's a video okay <laughs> it's gonna be loud then you can insert the bones but only the ones that go in the stomach bit of the corset as the ones that will be added over the boob area will have to be pinned afterwards otherwise you're going to have a collision of interests yeah. Next I began making the bias binding strips. Just fold the fabric down at the corner so that you're cutting across the grain. This is important because the bias of the fabric is more stretchy and malleable which will be super important when trying to get it around the curved edges of the corset. Make sure to the iron the raw edges inwards like this. <laughs> I'm never in a frame like it always cuts off the top of my forehead which is obviously one of my main features. And I know what you're thinking, for someone with such a big forehead, I tend to wear my hair away from my face quite a lot. You would be right. <laughs> okay, this is really a good ab workout. I've made my bias binding, I did quite a lot just in case. And now, I think I'm going to have to do some sort of stitching just to make sure that the lining and the main fabric on these back pieces is kind of attached. Then I'm going to have to fold down the centre back, iron it, do a little stitching line because the eyelets have got to go through four layers of fabric but I can't think of any other way to do it so that's how it's going to have to be. We're going to cut down this seam allowance and then stitch the bias binding on the top. I'm going to stop before I get a hernia. As I just attempted to explain, the next step was to sew the bias binding onto the raw edge of the centre back, then turn it inwards and stitch the seam allowance flap down with a stitch line super close to the nearest boning channel. After that I sewed around the entire corset to attach the lining layer to the front layer before adding on the bias binding. Then I sewed the excess bias binding into the inner part of the corset by hand. After that it was time to measure out where the eyelet should be positioned. I think I did mine two centimetres apart, maybe three, I can't really remember, just make sure they align on each side. This is actually where I went wrong because for Marie Antoinette's time period I really should have done spiral lacing but I put the eyelets in wrong so um, it's too late for that, oh well. And then I just hammered the eyelets in where they should be. Mm, 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 it's almost done, mm, mm, I've been working on it for two weeks. But it's almost done. <laughs> I just have to put in the eyelets. I've unpicked all of the ghastly looking stitches which are around the edges. Um, and then I just need to put in this little ribbon bit. The only thing is, is that my bias binding has made the arms kind of wider than they should have been. But that's okay. Like, it's going to still fit. It's going to still look cute. Can you imagine it? Then after putting in these little ribbons for the shoulder ties, it was time for the actual lacing. And then the corset was finished. Ooh, a look at the guts. So I didn't actually film very much of how I made the chemise, basically because I didn't think it would work. And it, it did, I'm very surprised. So I'm going to try and explain it to you now with the help of some clips. <laughs> In 
this part of the film she's wearing an off-the-shoulder kind of milkmaid top has a lot of ruffles along the top of it and as this is kind of later in the film we can assume that it's more towards the 80s 1780s that is this was the time when Marie Antoinette popularized their robe a la reine and this was a frothy kind of floaty and flouncy alliteration dress that was really scandalous at the time because it kind of looked like the queen was going around in her vest which she sort of was. In the milkmaid scene she's not wearing a robe a la reine she is still wearing the corset or stays with a chemise underneath it but it's definitely getting towards that more frothy look of the 1780s. So to make the chemise I use this cream coloured fabric that's kind of a fake silk viscosy material that was actually the lining of my curtains from when I made my 1890s corset. So to start off making the chemise I actually used this tutorial by Annika or Annika Victoria which was kind of a milkmaid off the shoulder top to get the general construction of the shape that I wanted. Firstly I cut out a piece which was the width around my shoulders plus 13 centimeters and the length I just kind of made up. Chemises at the time were fairly long but mine was actually I just did it too short but it would have been longer than this although not to the floor because the floors were dirty at the time so women wanted their skirts off of the floor so that they could preserve them. I then cut this in half so that I had a front and back section. So then you've got to get those sleeves and to do that you want to measure the width at the top of your arm and then add on like a lot of CMs to make it poofy. Cut a triangular slither from one of the corners to give it the illusion of an armpit. Okay, so all of what I just said can be much better explained in Anika's or Annika's, I don't know how to say them, video. So I definitely recommend go watching that and then come back for this bit. And then because I was making a three quarter length sleeve, I then cut out another rectangle, which I did just by sort of laying my arm on the fabric to get the length. And then the width I just did wider than the sleeve that I'd already cut because you're going to put some gathers into it to give it a bit more interest. And I also made some side gussets, which were these triangles that go in the bottom of the skirt, but I made mine a little bit too short and honestly they just they're just ugly so we're not going to focus on that but that's just so that the skirt is not too tight you're also going to need to make some ties out of the same fabric I made mine the same way I do by binding insert the gussets then turn the entire chemise inside out to attach the neckline gathering channel to make this channel all I did was sew down a length of fabric the same length as the top you need to leave a little gap though where those ties you made will pull through. Once you've done all of that, hem all of the raw edges like the bottom, any of the top that you didn't do before, and then pull up the strings to make the gathers. And basically that's that's it. It, it only took like a day. And so this is what the chemise looked like. Modelling it against a white wall was not an especially bright idea, so here are some photos of it against a black wall just so you can get the full experience. And then it was complete, the making of Marie Antoinette's underwear <laughs> as, a, as a milkmaid. Mm, 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 mm. I want candy. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm. This is the best thing I've ever made, hands down, like I'm not taking this off. Au revoir